it has interesting meanings if you Google, and you can Google everything. Uh, it means a senior member, senior member of the Christian clergy, somebody who is in charge. It also means an African weed bird, <laughs> and a chest piece, and a mulled and spiced wine. I did not actually know that before. But the word episcopos, bishop, uh, the English word bishop comes from episcopos, and epi means over, and scopos means looking, like somebody who looks over. The image here is, um, is uh, from the catacombs from Rome, one of the catacombs, I think it's a Calix, Calixus catacomb. And there's an image of a person doing something, something ceremonial, praying or, or, or probably praying. And uh, it could be a female or a male, right? We can't quite tell. Uh, I'm drawn to evidence like this from the earliest centuries. Especially when today there are still Lutheran communities that do not ordain women or who want to go back on that, like Latvian church, Australian church is still deliberating that. And, and when we were arguing amongst us Lutherans, about should we ordain women or not? Um, and these voices are very much alive still. Uh, I, I, I'm drawn to visual imagery too, because sometimes it's not enough how we read the written. But let's see, that looks like a woman to me, and she seems to be in a priestly role. And it appears that uh, there were women with the um, title of uh, female version of bishop in the early centuries. So that's something to think about. So this image is there just um, to remind us of that when we talk about offices, we used to think that when we talk about offices in the early church, we're talking about men. But we're not. We're talking about men and women. And we can identify when things change so that women were excluded from the more official roles of those who prayed. There are the guys. <laughs> Episcopal, uh, Episcopal, Episcopal came to be meaning this office of um, 
uh, or church leader didn't have any other meanings earlier. And those who believe that, that the office of bishop has always belonged to men, they tend to think that if we ever see a great stone or, or uh, epitaph where the word episcopize with the female name, that means that that word actually means something different. <laughs> For no other argument but that it's a female name. So there's a little bit of debate on that. Can we really say that women were bishops in the early church? And if they were, they were the bishops in the role that we think the men were. The bishop's office became the central organizing office by the third century. Christians in the Holy Roman Empire were linked in a network of episcopacies, each of which had a base in a city. The bishop's job seems to have been a, a, a city job. Early on, bishops were equal and served in the collegial ministry. Uh, we learn from, for instance, a church father called Cyprian from the early 3rd century on this who wrote a, a treatise called On Unity. So bishops are equal, they work in a network, and they keep the church together and support its spreading. And we have uh, areas of uh, concentration there. We have a bishop of Rome, uh, we have a, a, a patriarch of Rome, patriarch of Constantinople, patriarch of Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria. Do we need, do we need more bishops? As Christianity is beginning to spread, uh, the job, the needs uh, warrant the need for more. But initially, there was no need for more than um, um, a few. Speaking of unity, so we have this collegial system of five patriarchs. And what's causing a little bit of friction there is that, that the patriarch of Rome, the bishop of Rome, um, that office has both served as a unifier, even till our day, St. Francis and his office really unifies a much bigger community of Christians than, than we do through it by the constitute. But at the same time, the same office brought a little bit of a wedge between these other bishops or patriarchs. The question already early third century was this. Should we give more power to this bishop of Rome? Should we, would it help us? Are there, are there any reasons for us to think that the bishop of Rome is just simply more central and more important than the other bishops? How would it go today in the bishop's convocation and one of you would say, I'm the uber bishop. <laughs> it probably wouldn't go too well. Well, what would be the reasons that they would even think of that? Why wouldn't they say that the bishop of Jerusalem is the most important one? Well, Rome is becoming the center. Rome is the Washington DC of the Christianity of the time. So there's that. Um, and the fact that Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome and buried in Rome, and there are footprints floating all over the place. So the place is considered a little bit holier than the other places because of the burial sites of these saints. Um, and the, so just Rome becomes the center also because Rome becomes the center of the Holy Roman Empire, also politically, culturally, all the ways. But remember, it's still just a bishop we're talking about. <coughs> bishop of this place. So it is a little different place to be a bishop. This is Vatican. How many of you have been to Vatican? It's a pretty impressive place. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. So this is the, I'm going to say, this is a little bit of a footnote about the significance of Rome and, and papacy before we get back to the bishop. So this is the St. Peter's, St. Peter's Basilica, huge, built on the top of, a, let's say, a city of death, an old burial site. And underneath there are all these layers of stuff. And under the high altar, if you go inside,
inside this basilica, he was the high altar. <coughs> Underneath there are all these layers of history. You can go there. You don't want to go there if you're close to Paul because you have asthma. It's really musty and dark. There. But if you go, you can go underneath there, under the altar, and you see a hole from where they found Peter's bones that are preserved in a, in a small chest. The story of Peter's bones really was important for the rise of Roman bishop status. It just really was because Jesus gave Peter keys, symbolically, right? Jesus named Peter to go and be the leader. And he wasn't the greatest as leader, but, but the people, I mean, it's pretty really strong, but, but Jesus chose this man for that. And after Peter comes the other um, leaders. So to be able to identify physically the bones of big Peter under your church, that was a factor that led to it. Gave, gave more reasons for the Roman bishop to, to, to demand more authority. <coughs> the, um, do you know the story about Peter's bones? I may tell you a little bit about that. How many of you have been under the... Yeah, did you hear the story about how they found the bones?
and yet he needed bishops. <coughs> bishops were the ones who also gave others courage and direction. Here's a, a bishop, Ignatius of Antioch, eaten by lions, symbolically and really, and this icon of the first time. Thank goodness for the Emperor Constantine, who converts to Christianity and end of his life and makes Christianity an accepted faith and the following emperors make it makes Christianity the only accepted faith. The persecutions are over and bishops have a peace and a calling to get organized and focus on other things than survival. This August, uh, no, Constantine, Constantine having a vision of, of Christ. When Emperor Constantine early 4th century, makes Christian faith accepted and ends the persecutions. The previously persecuted bishops are now called in for leadership roles like ever before. They get all kinds of responsibilities, from management to jurisdiction, money matters. Some bishops become advisors of the emperor. This is unheard of. This is unheard of. The persecuted people, produce people in an office who then advise the Holy Roman Emperor. Most importantly though, for the future of Christian faith, most importantly, the bishops become the leading theologians. Council of Nicaea 325. My students hate this council because we talk about it so much, but so much happened there. And look who is present. Tons of bishops. 325. Bishops were called by the emperor, who is upset that Christians are fighting and, and, and kind of fragmenting the Holy Roman Empire and, and, and causing disorder and ruckus. So the emperor calls a church council. And not just any council. He invites about 18... 18, no, 1,800 bishops from East and West. So by 325, we have more than five bishops. Lots of them. Lots of them. Lots of them. So about 300 come from the East, six from the West, and they are called to this council in the city of Nicaea to settle on the issues of doctrine. Doctrine. They are to re refute and reject and counter dangerous teachings of a man called Arius. Arius was a man who tried to make sense of who Jesus was and considered it more logical to consider Jesus as somebody of a third kind. Not human, not divine, but of a third kind, but definitely not God like God the Creator. Kind of a logical way to think, probably as many people out on the streets or maybe some in this room thing, but that was considered not helpful and uh, was rejected <laughs> by the bishops. So the bishops were called to be the theologians and to decide on the proper language for God. That's a pretty important path. So when we say the creed, we are reciting the words that the early bishops gave to us. And some of these bishops had their eyes popped, they were blind, crippled, they, they had been heavily persecuted, and they gave it their best shot to figure out what is Trinity, how should we come together to say who our God is, so that it makes sense for the Romans, uh, uh, and it is eloquent enough to argue with the philosophers, it was the bishops who did that. And not all these bishops had a PhD. So, the, bishop, uh, the Council of Nicaea uh, gave us our Trinitarian language and first arguments about Christ's two natures. It also decided a couple of other things. You never know what the bishops have to decide on, such as some things never change. In 325, they had to argue about um, should we let women think? The answer is no. Um, should men be allowed to castrate themselves to be holy than the others? No. Um, and also bishops did, decided amongst themselves that bishops couldn't just leave their diocese and go to another diocese. Once, once you're in a bishop in one place, you just stick there and not go. 
So Christianity spreads as the official religion of the empire from Armenia, Persia to Ethiopia, Ireland, and Germany. And guess who are in a leading position in, in orchestrating this and doing this? The bishops. St. Patrick in Ireland, Ulfilas, 4th century with the gods, Froentius with Ethiopia, and Nestorius, a really interesting bishop, uh, from um, Persia to China. It was bishops showing with their own example, what does it mean to be a Christian? It means that you take the good news, and you, that means you take it bodily with you. You have no email, you have no telephone, it's you. So you go. These bishops, I need to tell you a story. This is an example of a bishop being in a key position in a Christian country. This is Bishop Henry from Sweden. Any Swedes here? All right. So Henry, oh, I think it was about 11th century, is on a mission to Finland, where Finns are not Christian. They worship the, the deities in the trees and the water, and, the, and well, not worship, but they honor and have a relationship with the different deities that are in the nature. They're perfectly happy with that. Uh, and then come these, and they even have the Kalevala explaining how everything was came to be, and so there's really no need for this foreign faith called Christianity. Well, Bishop Henry comes on a mission with his delegation, and they basically made this irresistible offer, indecent proposal for the Finnish forest people, that you either accept the baptism, or you will lose your head. And um, so the most Finns say, sounds like a good idea, and they were <laughs> Christianized. Except this one peasant called Lauli. He got really ticked off. So when Henry is taking a little evening stroll on, the, on an ice on a winter night in Finland, Lauli follows him, and the legend says that Lauli, the peasant, put an axe on this bishop's head. He said, I don't want to be a Christian. So Lauli and uh, uh, Hendrik are kind of legendary figures in Finland, and Hendrik became one of the patron saints of Europe for suffering at the death of martyrdom. You see, there's the axe, and there's Lali. And even though Lali killed the, the bishop, the bishop is now saved, and he's kind of standing on the bishop. <laughs> so anyway, uh, looking at the different personalities and different times for serving in the office when we're looking at the different bishops, we can make some observations. So bishop is a title and it's a job, and then there are people who have that office. And some bishops were stronger, some were more morally apt than others. Some um, were interested in unity, some were interested in pushing the envelope and introducing reforms. Uh, one of the most famous reforming popes from the early church are Pope Gregory, is Pope Gregory the Great from uh, Diet 604, who really gave a face to what does it mean to be a bishop. Bishop is somebody who has an oversight of reforms and uses that authority to push uh, changes. Um, Ethiopians, etc., etc. So I'm gonna uh, skip this. So, but as, as the Christianity is spreading with the leadership and with the um, personal example of the bishops, at the same time there is this friction going on between um, these different people. So we have all these working bishops all over, and 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 Roman bishop is claiming more and more power, more and more power. And then we have a sort of a dual going on between the Roman bishop and the patriarch of Constantinople. Um, just something to remember. So our bishops of the early church are hands-on, 
people without their personal involvement, not all the nations that we know of in the European lands would have converted. And many of these missions were somehow stimulated or stirred by or orchestrated from the Rome. It seems like that the Roman bishop was more involved in indigenous people out there. By the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages, the Roman bishop has become the most powerful bishop. One of them, um, if you want to meet the ultimate superpower bishop, the most powerful pope that ever existed, Pope Innocent III from the 11th century, who really had supreme power over salvation, over doctrine, and also exercised huge amount of political power. He was next to the Roman emperor, he was the king, and had the theology to support it. And that theology goes all the way back to, who's bombs are under my church? Peter's, who is sitting on the throne there? I am, I am the second Peter, etc., etc., etc. Later, already in the 14th century, uh, it's become too late to have that kind of episcopacy. There's a stuff going on in Europe. Europe is uh, being fragmented. There's a rise of nationalism, uh, split between East and West. And there's this Pope called Boniface VIII, who tries to be like innocent. He said, me too. And he says this outrageous doctrine. And I tell you the quote tomorrow. That, because our reformers quote this man's quote, basically saying that your salvation depends on your obedience to me. And if you're not with me at every, in every manner of the word, you are damned. That caused a little bit of friction with the other popes, I mean the other bishops, and, and also um, just with regular people. So our reformers react to that kind of statement coming from late medieval Pope, that you think salvation depends on you, and not just on your office, but on you personally. I mean, that's a lot of caca in the book, right? Symbolically, the bishop's office expands during the Middle Ages at the same time as Boniface VIII's case proves the lines between spiritual and political become blurred. The big territory and distances in Europe make it difficult for any bishop to hold power and control uh, all the uh, congregations, and, and even within his own synod. Not to mention mending the synodical or, or uh, how do you say, caring for the synodical relations uh, with other bishops. I mean, things as as, Christ, as Europe is boiling and becoming more fragmented, and the Holy Roman Empire is growing and uh, and Christianity is spreading so that the numbers are just too huge for any bishop to have oversight of all of them. Um, and the communications is split between these different bishops who are all busy taking care of their own area. That what was originally a good thing, this collegial network of bishops who are equal and, and who provide unity, that's lost. And the medieval bishops become really lords like mini kings who are very politically involved and overwhelmed and overworked and, uh, and they are engaged in a power struggle between each other and not just between each other but also with the secular rulers. So the papacy, the bishop's office really gets kind of carried away and loses its focus. <coughs> and of course we can explain some of that from just what's going on in the world, but also the personalities. When we look at the colorful stories, the, each bishop brings something to the office and the, and the tradition about that, because it, it's human beings who are in the office. In the East, the East and West split for many reasons, and then 54 it becomes more official, there's mutual excommunication, and with, with East I mean Uh, let's say, like that, east and west. In the east, it seems that the bishops there preserve more their role as a spiritual leader, and they have the support of the empresses, empresses and emperors. 
Whereas in the West, because the Roman bishop's office becomes so puffed up, and because he is so tangled with the, with the Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor that there is a, an ongoing power struggle through the Middle Ages leading up to Reformation, and it is one of the reasons for Reformation, is this power struggle and not a helpful relationship between, let's say, uh, Obama and our presiding bishop. Because these two powers have been in constant power struggle for centuries. Um, it started to erode the whole office of bishops. I mentioned earlier Gregory the um, Gregory from the uh, who died 604 starting a reform program. So because of these reasons I was mentioning, every now and then a pope emerges or a bishop emerges who um, who uh, kind of has this calling that things have realizes that things have gotten out of hand and and that the focus of the bishops always has been lost. One of these bishops is um, Gregory uh, VII from the 11th century, who wants to use the power of the Roman bishop to implement and install and inspire and legislate a thorough and ambitious reform program that includes things such as defining the bishop's role and territorial issues, uh, acting um, against uh, setting of bishop's office or, or, or priest jobs, and uh, asserting and, and demanding clergy celibacy, this is becoming now a, a, an issue, and asserting papal control over episcopal appointments, mainly saying that really the Roman bishop, the pope, should have a say in all the appointments for other bishops' appointments. Yeah, bishops, regardless of this reform effort, our bishops are becoming more and more feudal lords who rule large dioceses. They have large staff, they own schools and soldiers, they sound and walk and talk like secular princes. Uh, and while there's a celibacy rule on, um, at work, uh, many of our bishops have concubines, they have children, uh, while they are teaching the uh, demanding celibacy from the clergy in general. How, to give an example, without getting into detail, how, how um, difficult the relations between secular rulers and bishops were, thinking of Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Beckett, was killed because he opposed the king. Put your minds around that a little bit. We get an archbishop killed because he is opposing the king. So, as a, maybe the most violent example of the tension. In their own spheres, medieval bishops remain busy with administrative and pastoral duties in their dioceses, and more and more our bishops are monks, unless they are so <coughs> secular clergy. So when we have the early bishops were martyrs, kind of without necessarily training or candidacy and no doctorates, but their qualification was maybe their passion for Christian faith and, and bravery and persecution. In the Middle Ages, our, our bishops, who are still the theological leaders, they are monks. So this is something to think about. If the bishops gave us our doctrinal Foundation. If the bishops gave us our, our language of our Trinity, if the bishops gave us our most rudimentary fundamental theological language, and we're talking about the early bishops, who were bishops who had suffered, and who were very passionate about God, but who could have been married, there was no rule yet to be, be celibate. And then we have these medieval bishops who have more power, and if they want to be involved in theology, they have even more power. But they come from a very particular place in life, being they are supposedly celibate men. So it's just an observation where our leaders and where our, our theological sources come from. One of these most important 
important and influential bishops of all times, and we could say the most important and influential theologian after Jesus and Paul for Christianity is this man, a bishop. And I usually ask my students to read this bishop's autobiography because uh, he gives really good warning what bishop's job entails, but also humanizes the office. Would you guess who this person is? Yes, Sorry? Augustine of Hippo? Augustine of Hippo, yep. <coughs> Augustine of Hippo, the man who exemplifies how nobody <coughs> in their right mind wants to be a bishop. <laughs> because it's a tough job. Uh, it's a tough job. And also exemplifies how the best bishops are ones who didn't necessarily aspire, but they were called for it by other people. Augustine did not want to do that. Uh, he wanted to do other things with his life. He was dragged into that and he writes about that. Let me read you a little bit what he writes. And the book I was referring to is his Confessions, but this is from the City of God. Um, he wished to show that the episcopate is the title of a work, not of an honor. It is a Greek word that signifies that he who governs superintends or takes care of those whom he governs, for epi means over as cobain to see. Therefore, episcopain means to oversee. So that he who loves to govern rather than to do good is no bishop. Accordingly, no one is prohibited from the search of the truth, for in this leisure may most logically be spent. But it is unseen to covet the high position requisite for governing the people, even though that position be held and that government be administered in a seemly manner. And therefore, holy leisure is longed for by the love of truth. But it is the necessity of love to undertake requisite business. If no one imposes this burden upon us, there is mercy, we are free to uh, sift and contemplate truth. But if it, in this prophecy, is laid upon us, we are necessitated for love's sake to undertake it. And yet not even in this case are we obliged wholly to relinquish the sweets of contemplation. For were these to be withdrawn, the burden might prove more than we could bear. He knew the burdens a bishop carries. And he's here lamenting that he had to make a choice. And his love for truth and contemplation, he realized he has less time for that when he has an office where he carries other people's burdens. I was asked a couple of times if I wanted to be a candidate for a bishop. And I thought about it. And I thought to my husband about that. And he, he brought this up with me. He said, do you know what it takes to carry people's burdens? And it's hard for everybody, and for some it's even harder. And uh, so I'm sharing that with you, as some of you are maybe thinking about the, uh, the office, that maybe this might be the most important requirement, that you are able to survive the carrying of burdens. What do you say? No. And one does that with God's power. Augustine beautifully as exemplified. Let's see what time is it? Okay, we are almost done here. So this was kind of all over the thing. I just wanted to show you things that I, I, I found out about the bishop's office and how, how to organize our thoughts about what it was and what kind of issues we were thinking about as we think of episcopacy today. Um, I want to say some things about um, the function of the episcopacy in, in line of what we know of the early church. So the office in the early church, with the writing of the creeds and, and keeping people together, the office of the bishop was instrumental in providing unity. And here we remember not that many years ago, the office of bishop seemed to become the divider. But its purpose has been always to to provide unity from the early church. And as we mentioned, bishops negotiate the theological language that we use in our liturgies. So we have bishops' voice in our ears and our hearts 
So how would the office then become opposite of unity? Bishops who were able to provide unity in light of early church, bishops who were able to be most powerful in the unifying force, seems to be that they were bishops who took it very seriously what the office calls for and had their priorities right, but they also brought their own person to it. Some personalities are less successful in providing unity than others. <laughs> 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 right? Seems like in this synod, you'd be very fortunate to have a person who has the skills to make a unity without suppressing diversity, but also brings a person who has this unifying charisma. And it seems that in Bishop's office, one needs that kind of charisma. Um, early on, men like Cyprian uh, were saying things like, Christians, to be a Christian, you need to be with the bishop. And that can mean good things and bad things, if, if in a sense of boniface, that you are either with me or you go to hell. That's the wrong kind of being with the bishop. But what, what these early teachers mean, I think, is that if you are with the bishop who has promised to teach in accordance with the tradition and live with the tradition, um, then when you are with the bishop, you are with the tradition. So it's less about the person and power, but more about finding a home in the tradition. And the bishop's office and person embodies that. Bishops were responsible for the people, quite literally, their shoulders, on their shoulders was the salvation of people. Augustine laments on this, that I don't want to have this, but so it is, that these people's salvation is on my shoulders. Maybe exaggerated a little bit, but um, that's how he felt. And this is really interesting. The bishop's office had prophecy as its prerogative. The prophets of the early church were supposed to be the bishops. And I had never really thought about this until I began to look at this years ago. That, but I had never thought of bishops' role as that of a prophet. But isn't that kind of what is required? Unless the job, unless it becomes a job about power. <coughs> the prophetic element keeps the bishop's office um, um, open to God's spirit that provides unity, right? But does that also mean the prophecy? Does it also imply courage and um, boldness to propose changes? Does it also mean that? Maybe we'll talk about that tomorrow. Bishops were the voice of God, the connector with God. Their office and their person was to which God spoke. And as all this is happening, this kind of uh, understanding of where all bishops' office belongs is okay, good to remember that women are utterly excluded from this, this scheme. That for God to speak through women, they would have to have other ways, be prophets without the office, but that's another story. Almost done here. Oh, by the way, did you notice that our Augustine is pretty dark skin? And this has been one of the great, great uh, learning moments for my students every semester when we look at the early fathers, that most of them were not white. Our, our roots are from, from places where people are, are not white. <laughs> so deal with that. <laughs> like, so uh, it, it's helpful. Did okay. So come, some instructions from the early sources. What, what, what would be good qualification for a bishop? Didache is an old rule book for Christian uh, order, uh, organization, liturgy, etc. Et so this is one of the earliest sources we have when we have like how would we learn about what early Christians really thought about how Christians should live and organize their life together. Didache. Well, choose for yourselves bishops and deacons who are worthy of the Lord, individuals who are humble and not eager for money, but sincere and approved. Bishops should be above reproach, the husband of one wife, 
temperate, sensible, dignified. Temperate, that's a pretty good term, don't you think? Sensible. Not all the bishops were there. We have some really crazy guys that were good bishops. <laughs> hospitable. And this is a Lutheran virtue, how to be hospitable. An apt teacher. When we think of bishops today, do we immediately think of our teachers? They should be our teachers, but do our bishops have time to teach us? Not a drunkard, that would be a problem. Not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome, and no lover of money. You see how money keeps coming up? <laughs> he must manage his own household well. Keep children submissive and respectful. Because if you can take care of your own household, how would you care for God's church? That's from Timothy. Bishop is one who is one who exercises self-control. All right, none of us wants to be a bishop now. Yeah. One can govern a larger community. One who is appropriate, knows what is called for in each situation. One who maintains authority <coughs> to keep children and slaves. The other Christians have all slaves for centuries, yeah. and the bishops have been right there. Not abusive. Not greedy. See, the medieval bishops were really greedy, but this is actually, these are written before the, this, this are from the early church, so it seems like a sin of greediness has always been there. <coughs> Letter from Ignatius, second century, bishop who says, who was martyred, martyred himself. Bishop is somebody who sees that the widows are not neglected, who sees her, himself as a protector, who provides financial support. Make sure that the slaves are treated well. And deals with the details with the slaves. Finally, some, some random thoughts. A bishop, according to the early church's fathers, is somebody who discerns the apostolic truth. Who defends the apostolic truth. Who decides how to present orthodoxy. How to decide what should be included and what rejected. Discerns through the prophecy, knows how to deal with schisms, hmm. decides what to do with people who have lapsed during persecution. What would that mean in our time? I'm not sure. Deciding who could marry whom, and then the administration, finances, education. Would you say, Bishop Wells, that today, how much of your time goes with the last one? Mm. Yeah. So tomorrow, we come back and we're going to look at a little bit how did thinking of Episcopacy change during the Reformation, and, and then we can have a discussion about what we have learned from the early church and medieval when we're thinking about the bishops of his today, and how would we reform it today? What needs to be reformed? Are we happy with how our bishop's office is defined today? Uh, what more could the bishops do? What more could the bishops do? Or what less could they do? So that's the goal for tomorrow. And just for thinking, this is a, an interesting image of, uh, of the different branches of Christianity. And to think that if the, there's always been bishops from Peter on. Let's say Peter was a bishop, an overseer. Bishops have always been there, always been there. They come to splits. And in the Christian and the Protestant churches, Lutheran, Anglican, Calvinism, and Baptism, uh, there are different forms of bishops in all of these. Of course, the Catholic Church still continues to have bishops. The Orthodox Church still continues to have bishops. So, of all the things that have changed in Christianity, one thing has not changed. There is a need for a bishop, and there are always bishops, and that office has continued to. Maintain unity, but also give a definition for different forms of Christianity in that teaching of it. I think that's all I have for today. Should this be good for today? Okay.